Hi, Journey family. We're so glad that you're joining us today for some time together. Before we go any further into the service, we just want to take a minute to pause. And um, I actually was just reminded on the way here of um, the song about Emmanuel and that simple phrase, um, three words, God with us. And I just wanted to remind you, whatever you're in right now, um, the diagnosis that your family has, the um, heartbreak that someone is going through, the joy, the answer to prayers, the healing, wherever you land on the spectrum, God is landing with you right there. And this morning, he has something for you, specifically. So let us not move one moment further without aligning our hearts and minds to what it is that he has for us. Let me pray over you before we start. God, we thank you for choosing to be with us. Thank you for not leaving us. Thank you for not forgetting us, but for seeing us so clearly and choosing to sit with us in the midst of it all. In a season that has us pulled in so many directions, where it's so easy to feel divided in our families, in our jobs, in our own hearts, we ask that you would bring us together in the way that only you can. Make us whole, make us new. Thank you for being a God in a good mood with a good plan. We ask that you reveal what it is you have for us today. We love you, amen. Sing, Lord. 
again. I didn't introduce myself last time. My name's Ashley. Um, I'm the Weekend Experience Coordinator here at Journey, and it is so great to spend some time with you today. If you are watching on Church Online, we would love for you to say hey in the chat section or send us a wave or anything like that. It's so nice to get connected with you. Um, I have a couple of important things to let you know about. The first is our album is out. 
It is called Our Own Hallelujah, and it has been long awaited, and we're so excited that it's here. So you can listen to that on any platform where you listen to your music. So Apple Music, Spotify, those are great choices. Those are the two that I know of. Um, and every time that you play one of those songs, the proceeds from your listen go to global and local missions. So a great way to help out and also get your worship on. We also have a Christmas album on there, so if you type in in JCC Music to find us. You can find our own Hallelujah, and you can also find our Christmas album. Speaking of Christmas, we have some services coming up. We can't wait to be together. So we have two days of services. The first is the 23rd. Services are at 3 and 5, and the 24th is at 2, 4, and 6. And if you want to join us online for Christmas Eve services, that's our 4 o'clock service on the 24th. We would love for you to extend an invitation. So if you want to, the invites um, on like actual tangible invites are postcards this year. So you can handwrite the vintage old fashioned way, a postcard, and we will actually mail it for you. So if you don't know where your stamps are, or you can't find them, um, or you just don't wanna go buy stamps, then you can come get an invite here at Journey and then put it in one of our drop boxes and we will make sure that it gets in the mail for you. If you wanna send a digital invite, you just go to christmasatjourney.com that has all of the info about all of our services. You can also get tickets for in-person services at christmasatjourney.com. And if you scroll to the bottom of that page, you will see a button that says share with a friend. So when you click on that button, it has all of our invites for all of our services, in person, online, kids, there's digital flyers for all of them. And if you hit download, it will put it on your device and you can send it out in an email or a text message. You can share it on your social media. That would be awesome. We would love to have as many people celebrating Christmas with us as possible. We are celebrating Christmas all month long. Our celebrations don't really stop. Um, we are constantly looking for ways to be partnered with our local community, our global community, and just doing everything we can to spread the kingdom all around. And so we'd love to ask you, if you call Journey Home, um, to partner with us in that. So if you'd like to give, you can do so online using the little link down here, or you can click the Give button if you're watching in church online. Um, and right after this, Ed will be up to continue our series, Christmas at Journey. been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. And I have wrestled and I tremble towards surrender. Chase my heart adrift and drifted on again. Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. It's 
grace I could never add to be somebody you still want somehow you love me as you find me you love me as you find me who am I to think your glory needs my praises but it's borrowed breath is yours Lord take it all Cause you are faithful and you are gracious and I'm just grateful think you don't need a single thing still you own Somebody you still want Somehow You love me as you find me Love me as you find me You love me as you find me Love me as you find me. Your love's too good. Love me as you find Your love's too good to leave me here. Your love me as you find Your love's too good to leave me here. Your love me as you find Your love's too good to leave me here. Your love me Love me as you 
you are right now, um, just, let's, let's just stand up. We have a few people in the room. We have you in your room. Um, just stand up right now. And Sam, can you put the guitar back on for just a moment? And just that last little line, can you just sing that a few more times? And let's just, let's proclaim this over ourselves and our world that just whatever is going on, wherever it's wherever life is punching you in the face right now or holding you down, that God's love, wherever it finds you, God loves you. So just let's soak in that. And if you're listening, you know, if you're at home and you're relaxed on your couch, stand up. Yes, stand up, get up, get, come on, get up. Well, wait, I know you're not standing up yet. All right, why don't you close your hand and extend your arms out and just, just take a moment and let the love of God just wash over you right now. Can you guys just, just let, roll around in this a little bit for us? going to wait uh, to the end of the service for this, but I just feel compelled that, that we just can't wait any longer. Just, just bring, bring it to the Lord right now. The, the thing that is causing you to second guess, that challenge, that bring it to him right now and his love it really is it's too good to leave us in this spot like I said there's some people in the room a few people in the room right now and there's you and me and let's just speak it out before the Lord and maybe maybe there are times when all you can pray is just one word, maybe you can just get a name out of your throat or just you can, all you can say is, Lord, please. Lord, please. 
But the Bible says some very deep things about how God meets us when we pray. It says that Jesus himself is interceding for you, that the Holy Spirit is interpreting that one or two words into exactly what needs to be said in the throne room of heaven. So just right now, whatever, just say it out loud, whatever it is, wherever your moment and place of need, just say it together, let's say it. Maybe it's a name. Say it right now. Shane. Okay, can, can I just borrow us all for a second? And um, I have some friends here and I'm gonna, I think you guys would wanna do this. So, um, uh, we have a little 14 month old in our midst that just yesterday got diagnosed with uh, a form of leukemia. His name is Colton. So we're going to pray for him, right? Everybody good with that? Yeah. And so let's right now, let's speak his name into the very presence of God. I, I, I'd like you, wherever you're at, wherever your house is, wherever room you're watching this or by your phone, and I'd like you guys in the room to just say this little one's name and let's just declare the grace and the healing of Jesus over him and his parents and his grandparents and his aunt and uncle. Can you just join with me? And I'm going to ask, can you guys do this? Can we just join our hearts? And can you just say this out loud with me? Ready? Here we go. Say, Colton, be healed in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Colton, be healed. Yes, Lord. And so, God, we're uh, right now, we are saying that you are writing a story to your glory and that um, we pray that you raise this little one up and I pray that you would get this family through this trial, that you would draw so near to them that they would feel your strength like never, ever before. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen, amen. All right, bless you guys and let's... Um, Hey, thanks to our band and for just holding us in this moment. And uh, thanks, Dennis. And you guys can have a seat. I mean, you're in your house. You can do whatever you want, right? So, as much as I enjoy bossing you around, I, I don't think you have to listen. But um, <clears throat> yeah. So. Um, we're going to start uh, our, our um, I think we need this. Let me just uh, start our time with every now and then we, we've got to like pause and kind of have a moment that, that we call yay God, like where God's doing something really cool and, uh, and we need to like highlight it and, it and it helps us have vision for, for stuff. And so um, I'm going to invite my friend Tobias up here and I want to tell you a little um, just a little story, and I want you guys to rejoice in this and, uh, and to kind of get fired up and uh, get some vision with us. So um, uh, when uh, we did, like, if you, when you come to Journey for one of our services, I'll tell you about that in just a second, about Christmas Eve and all that stuff. But um, uh, you'll see how awesome the plaza looks and how the worship center is redone. That's been true for a little while. And it started with this big thing we did called I Live the Journey. And one of the things that God led us to as we are raising money, um, several million dollars for all this to happen, is we said we want to take 10% of whatever comes in for Journey and kind of invest it into to stuff outside of Journey, into mission. And one of the um, things that God led us to 
was to partner with our friends from a, a ministry called Young Life. Tobias, can you take a step over here? And um, so we invested in them. Uh, we should be able to see each other. There it is. There, we're on the screen now. And um, uh, can you just introduce, you have a Young Life? Sure. <laughs> and so just, just tell us about it. what is this thing that we're doing together? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're not familiar with Young Life, the mission of Young Life is to introduce adolescents to Jesus Christ and help them grow in their faith. Uh, we kind of specialize into reaching out to students who don't have a cultural or family background in church. Which is a lot of kids. Which is a lot, over half. And so our, uh, our main desire is that we would train adults who are going to disciple young people. And so mm -hmm. that's what I do. I'm the area director for East County Young Life. So East County is kind of, we're all familiar with what East County is. So yes, much. yeah. Yeah, so that's my job. And so, yeah. Um, uh, funny, yeah, you mentioned the, uh, the plaza. So uh, we, we had applied and reached out to be the recipient of that 10% from that. Mm -hmm. And after coming in and talking to the board, you guys awarded us uh, those funds. And uh, we used those funds to be able to hire another full-time staff person that's uh, concentrating solely on the Grossmont Helix area, which Yay. is pretty neat. Very neat. And, um, and he's a local, right? I mean, you guys, uh, yeah. guy, he was in Arizona, but you pulled him back to where he's from. You know? Yeah, yeah. We, we drug him over from, from GCU. That's where he went to school. He was actually a teacher for two years in Phoenix, but uh, he's from Grossmont High School, so he's homegrown uh, from around here. His family went to Community Covenant. They have uh, deep roots in the community, but he always had this desire and this pull to come back to East County and to reach lost kids, mainly because he, he's from here and he knows yeah. what it was like. Yeah, that's and GCU is Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon University. University big yeah. Christian school in, yeah, big in Christian. Phoenix. So, like... Um, so what does that look like? Like, you know, we're reaching kids on, on campuses, students, high school and junior high students mostly. What does that look like? Yeah, so we, we have uh, four different ministries here in East County. We have middle school, high school, college, and then a teen moms outreach ministry. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what that looks like is a lot of like what Jesus did, which is uh, going into the community, developing real life friendships, eating with people, being with people. Young life leaders is what we would call our volunteers. They focus on developing real life friendships between an adult and a young person mm -hmm. in order to uh, get to know who they are, develop uh, a relationship that is has trust and mm -hmm. has an insight that maybe you might not get from other kinds of friendships. Most yeah. young people don't have friendships with adults. They have yeah. coaches, they have teachers, they have parents, but rarely do they have somebody in their life that's there mm -hmm. uh, without an agenda. And so mm -hmm. our Young Life leaders, we, we go to football games, we go to plays, uh, we volunteer at the school, and Young Life leaders are 18 to 80. I mm -hmm. mean, they're people who are, <laughs> we got electricians, we've got other teachers, we've got bankers, we've got uh, people who are in college. It mm -hmm. really spans the gap, but it's just our volunteers, our leaders are people who look at adolescence as a stage of life where transformation can happen. So they go, they love on them. They get to know them. Hopefully, we use this phrase, win the right to be heard. Yeah. That's really what they're going for. Right. So, so much of the time that leaders spend is proving to kids that they love them just the way that they are. The worship song we just listened to that says, you love me as you find me. Yeah. That's really what we're hoping to do is love kids mm. as we find them. So, Young Life leaders are hanging out with kids that uh, you're not likely going to see show up on a Sunday mm. service or show up to a youth group. They're actually... Mm prototypically against that kind of stuff and push mm -hmm. back, but they're not against being loved and having a relationship mm -hmm. with an adult that cares for them despite who they are, what they do, or what they think. And, and, and we're doing this, like, on the campuses. Actively, in, yeah. In, you know, where students actually are, right? We're not saying, come to us. No. We're going yeah, we to have, them, Yeah, we have right? this kind of, uh, what we call our imperatives, where, which is we go where kids are. We go where they are. We give them a place to belong, give. and we share the gospel with them. It's, yeah. it's, it's pretty neat. You wouldn't think that we could fill a, a classroom full of kids that don't know the Lord and have them sit down and, and listen to a gospel message, but pizza can do a lot. <laughs> yes, God, that's why God so, invented pizza. Yeah, we're on yeah. a lot of the campuses, uh -huh. the high school campuses. We just call them lunch clubs, mm -hmm. and so our focus in that is just... Uh, Again, just it's mm. fun. It's exciting. You walk into a lunch club. If anybody that's part of a church, you walk in there and you go, this is a youth group. Mm. And it's like, well, yeah, but it just doesn't have mm. all the requirements, the barriers, and all the go-tos and steps that they, they need to fulfill in order to get there. We, we take it to them uh, in, in a flavor, uh, in a manner that's comfortable for them. And, and in a really obvious way. thing is it's actually there. It's a youth group that's yeah. It's like, here, here's where you are, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. we've noticed that kids are desperate for it. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody knows that. Kids want to know and understand and believe that they're created by a God that loves them, that mm -hmm. created them on purpose for a purpose. And mm -hmm. so we, we tell them that. We look them in the eyes in their own environment in a place where they're comfortable. We step out. We say we step out of our comfort mm -hmm. zone so that they can remain there. Yeah. So that as the gospel message, the good news comes, uh, there's no other 
distractions. There's no other things. There's no other requirements. And so uh, we get to reach a lot of really interesting kids, including myself. I was one of those stories of kids wow. that never would have gone to church. I, I had no interest, never would have developed mm-hmm. it. But a, a high school, in high school, a, a history teacher there who was a young life leader pursued mm-hmm. me and got, got to know That's me and so became a cool. friend. Yeah. And, and this like, this really works hand in glove with our youth ministry here at church and other churches youth ministry, right? Yeah. Like Morgan's really involved in Morgan's right. been involved in partnering with us since he got here. So yeah. that first week, um, first uh, week, his first week, <laughs> yeah, uh, like really hardcore. So he showed up and took him a while to figure it out. But his first week, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 I know you're kidding. Uh, He's yeah. a natural. Uh, That's yeah. great. But he showed up at Valhalla, uh, which is um, uh, at the at the time was was a big club and kind of heavy. And he he just merged right into mm. it, and it was awesome. And so he and JT, who's the guy that we hired with right. the funds uh, from Journey, thank you by yes. the way. Um, they partner to do stuff over at Helix because both of them have a, have a heart to go reach there. Morgan, ever since he was helping out at Valhalla, was always saying, I want to get on Helix. I want to get on Helix. I want to get on Helix. And in my job, my job is to hear that and go, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. And so for the next year, it became my job to figure out how to get him on campus. So yeah. we, we love to partner with people that have a heart for that kind of kingdom outreach, reaching the lost. Mm-hmm. And Morgan's by far one of our most faithful volunteers at those lunch clubs. Love so working great. with them. And it's cool so to do that great. with our home church, right? Like to have yeah, that same mentality, totally. that same DNA. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. yeah you know, and um, so like, I mean, I think most people would get this without you telling them, but so why, why do we need to have urgency about reaching students, high school and junior high students, college students? Like why? Look, we get church for adults. Let's yeah. just do that like what's what's the what vision should we have for like like why do we need to do this yeah it's a great question and I think that um understanding kind of the context from which you come I I grew up with a little bit of introduction to some church but I didn't have a lot of it most of the kids we talked to they didn't grow up in a family where they even understand what church is Mm -hmm. they have a huge cultural gap to what that means. And they, they think that the only place that they can engage God, that they can develop faith, that they can learn what the gospel message is, mm-hmm. is to go to church. And we know that that's simply not true. Anyone in church understands that this is a part of it, mm-hmm. but this isn't the only place that they grow. It's community groups. It's, mm-hmm. it's engaging, developing friendships, giving, all that stuff is a part of it. But kids think that there's this barrier that they just can't cross. And they have this mm-hmm. misconception, cultural misconception, that uh, they walk through the door at church and poof, they're going to explode. I mean, mm-hmm. kids that are... Several have. <laughs> no, no, but, uh, right. Yeah, so there's yeah. all those barriers. And, uh, it, and it's, it's really just a lot of cultural uh, misunderstanding correction. Mm-hmm. We're just trying to help them understand that's not the mm-hmm. case. And it's, when we show up, they go, oh, they'd never have me at church. We get mm-hmm. to say, we're the church. Yeah. And we're here and we, and we love you. And yeah. There's a funny story that I, I can't I take too long to tell, but about a kid named uh, Tuck, who's a football player over at Grossmont. He's a really neat kid. Came to camp with us once. Came to lunch club for two years. Uh, doesn't come from a Christian family. Uh, but we, I kept going to all the football games because there's a couple other kids I've been discipling on the team, the quarterback, a couple other guys like that. And it was super black. I don't know why I got in with these football boys because look at me, I'm not. <laughs> I don't know, man. You're no, no it's okay. That's nice maybe, of you, yeah. but no, so. no. Uh, and so I got to know this kid, Tuck, and we took him to camp, and he just fell in love with Jesus. And then I was like, hey, man, you want to go to, to church when we came back home? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I would love it. You know, you get that like church high yeah, that you get yeah. like all youth groups. Yeah. Stuff. And then like uh, a week after we got back, I'm like, hey, man, let's, let's go to church and let's, let's check it out. And he was, he, uh, I didn't get a response from him. And it was anybody that has, or you've all been teenagers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, no response. Just, yeah. He's ghosting me at this yeah. point, right? <laughs> and so uh, I was like, hey, man, like what's going on? He's like, hey, man, I, I love you, but I just, I got to let you know, like, I don't think the church thing's for me. I don't think like that's my thing, which is what a lot of these kids mm-hmm. really believe. Either mm-hmm. that's been told to them or uh, they just believe that because mm-hmm. of some cultural beliefs mm-hmm. about church. And so I was like, like, what changed, dude? Like, what, what, what happened about all that? And it's like, I don't know. He's like, hey, I, he's like, I like the way you talk about Jesus. And, and you know, I like, the, I like it when we hang out. Um, but he's like, I just don't think that's going to be me at, at, at a church, you know, mm-hmm. that, that kind of thing. And I said, okay, well, um, like, wh- why do you think that is that you're comfortable with me? He's like, I don't know. He's like, I know you like, you know, you like, like you love me, bro. You know, that kind of thing. And I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, I do. And, like, and I was like, but do you like trust me? And he's like, yeah, I trust you. And I said, well, the same way that you trust me is the way that I trust Ed when he gets up and he shares a message, you know, and so trust me on this. I think if you come, you'll be surprised. Mm -hmm. And he was like, all right, man, I'll come. And so that right there, that's Mm -hmm. what we're doing. That's the connection. Mm -hmm. We want to connect these kids to the larger body of Christ Mm -hmm. and the experience of the kingdom, Mm -hmm. but they need a handout. They need a connection. Mm -hmm. If you look at the story of Jesus, that's so much of what he did was Mm -hmm. stand in the gap, culturally stand Mm -hmm. in the gap, uh, theologically stand in the gap with people just in individual tiny relationships, just trying to connect them Mm -hmm. to the God that loves them because culturally there were so many barriers. 
So I love that story of him going through the synagogue with the whip, you know, it was, he's getting rid of all those barriers. And so that's, that's essentially what we're trying to be creative and figure out how to do. Yeah. And, um, we've said it a few times, like the people that have taken it, uh, taken the biggest hit from COVID are our young people, our students. Um, I mean, I know we're going to get back at it as soon as we can, but we've actually been able to continue ministering even during the season, right? Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's all about creativity. Yeah. You know, it's all about how, right. how faithful you are to it. You guys have found ways to make the gospel accessible to the rest of our, our church family. Mm-hmm. So we've done the same thing with kids. Mm-hmm. And so luckily enough, mm-hmm. uh, we've, we've got a lot of young people on our volunteer teams and a lot of, uh, a lot of older people with, uh, with, with some dedication to figuring it out. We did a lot of virtual upfront, but kids, kids have virtual fatigue. They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're really over it. Kids are yeah. uh, diving into depression. I, I lead our college group and I, I've seen a unprecedented amount of kids dropping out of college mm. because they don't think they're smart enough to be in college. Mm. And the reality is, is they're just, they're doing online school that they never trained for from mm. professors that never got trained on how to do it. Yeah. You know, it's not, I know that that's a tough, complex one. I'm just saying it's, it's having a hard impact on kids, but mm. uh, we've been meeting uh, outside as much as we can. But the beauty of it, of what we do, again, it, we're not a place or a program. Mm-hmm. We're a people and we're a community. Mm. And there's nothing outlawed in relationships, you know? And so when, when uh, events stop and when locations close down, mm-hmm. it's, to be honest, it's barely hit what we do. Mm-hmm. It, because our, our adults love these kids and they, and they mm-hmm. love them in return. There's this depth of relationship. The, any, the only thing that I think we're really missing out on, and this is something that makes it tough, is what we call contact work, mm-hmm. which is reaching out into the right. schools and meeting new kids. Right. There's almost an impossible way to do that. And we've, we've heard story after story of, of kids, you know, suicide is becoming a, a lot harsher. Um, self-harm, uh, mm-hmm. drug abuse, substance abuse, uh, domestic violence. We see these things on the rise. Right in the middle of that is a teenager with no control. Yeah. And so we've been just doing the best we can to just try to be available, make ourselves available to counselors at the schools, mm-hmm. all that kinds of stuff. But, um, man, it's weird, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's been hard to figure that out. So but weird. We've seen a lot of cool relationship development still yeah. happen in the midst of that because we're not limited by anything that can get shut down. Yeah, I love that. Well, just so you guys know, um, we, uh, we and, and myself and our board, we uh, invested $50,000 into Young Life. You did, really, which I think is stinking awesome, don't you? And uh, we were, yeah, you should clap for that. And um, uh, that enabled us to get on to more schools, right? To have twice as many. Twice as many. And so how this works, right? Like volunteers and come from where? Like churches like this maybe? And maybe? Yeah, everywhere. We got volunteers from Journey, from Foothills, from Skyline, from Shadow, from Meridian, from Pathways. I mean, you count it. We've got volunteers yeah. from all over the gamut. That's awesome. So like if, if I was interested in volunteering or maybe I wanted to, to maybe give some more to, because there's a, in fact, right now we're trying to hire one more staff, just like JT, and that doubled our ministry. There's a, we want to really be more in the Santeria and all those areas, right? Yeah, so my job is to develop East County, um, right. and so that's a big task. But we developed that into four different spots. we got Grossmont Helix, we've got Santee Lakeside, El Cajon, and Rancho San Diego. So right. our next spot that we're, we're slowly just moving through, and Santee Lakeside, we've got an amazing candidate over a two-year period of just kind of assessing and getting him ready, John Wooding. He's, a, yeah. he's a, another local guy, went to El Cajon High School, lives in Santee with his wife, five kids. He wants to do ministry full time and reach lost kids, and he's kind of fundraising right now. And he's—you can pray for him. He's—he's he's re- trying to raise thirty thousand. Uh, could to pray, be able to come on and full-time. we could—you could help him do that. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can give. You can pray. And so, what? Y- y- young. What's our website? We could go to uh, eastcounty.younglife.org. Eastcounty.younglife. And you can also, if you have questions, you can email me at Tobias at eastcounty.younglife.org. Or you could show up at church. Tobias is here, and you could say, yeah. "Hey, I want to help out." And. Uh, Man, we'd, we'd love to have you. Um, aren't you glad we did this? It's reaching young people, man. It's so, so cool. So um, let's give Tobias a massive hand and say thank you. Yay, God. Yay, God. Should we, should we tell him that other? Can, we're going to tell you one more thing. So uh, we had a time scheduled. Uh, when was our meeting with the board? Uh, last week, I think, or week, two weeks ago? Sure. Yeah, whatever. So... Um, you know, the amount that, that we dedicated to Young Life was $50,000, which is a, a decent chunk, right? And you're thinking, okay, that was a tithe off the top. It just so happened that out of nowhere that week, somebody gave a gift to, I don't know who it is, whoever you are, bless you. Anybody want to guess how much that was? $50,000, right? They knew nothing about this. But here's what that, here's among... 
I mean, if we've seen this once, we've seen it a thousand times. When you take a step of faith, like we did, God will meet you in that step of faith. Because you could have said, man, um, it was tough to do this. Why should we, like, get, because when you take a step of faith to move the gospel out, God always, always, always meets you in that step. So this is no exception. So are you fired up? You should be like, yay, God, a little bit. Yay, yay. All right. Thanks, Tobias. Bless you, man. Yay. You like that? Yeah. You like it or juice? All right. So um, uh, why don't you do this for me uh, or for yourself, really? Um, you can get your phone or uh, if, if you're, depending on how you're taking this in, you, there's a paper outline if you're here at Journey. And you might want to grab that. And uh, this, just to let you know, duh, right, that um, part of what we're doing is trying to um, we have an end of the year giving project. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this tonight was to remind you that part of that project goes into our, the reaching our community. And so we'd love for you to take part in that in any way you can. And then I just so happen to have right here um, one of our invite cards that Ashley already told you about. Um, I don't know if we can get a tighter shot of that right there. No? All right, there it is. Um, so this uh, Christmas at Journey, and you can... You can like mail it, to, you can write out somebody's address, you can hand it to them. Um, I was handing these out at uh, the, the gym that, um, I don't wanna say anything more about the gym, but because I just really want them to stay open, please God. But uh, so, uh, you know, there's, there's, it's time to, for us to get our invite on. And I don't know what this year is going to look like for people. I don't know. We've got, we're going to have gr a great Christmas here at Journey in a time when we need Christmas more than ever. I mean, that's, would you agree with that? I mean, if, if we've ever needed whatever joy, whatever goodness Christmas brings, dang, this year is the year. So we're going to grab hold of whatever joy to the world is out there with both hands, right? I mean, we have never needed it more than right now. So last week, we talked about the wonder of Christmas. Next week, we're going to talk about the hope of Christmas. On Christmas Eve, we're going to talk about the point and the purpose of Christmas. And Christmas Eve, we're going to have like lots of options for you. On Eve Eve, the 23rd, we're going to have two services in our tent in Tentosaurus. And uh, they're going to be awesome. And then on Christmas Eve, we'll have three services, two, four, and six, right here in the worship center. So whichever thing works for you, that's you, we invite you to be a part of that. And, and we'll be online also. So whatever it works, just take in as much Christmas as you, as you can. And this week, this week, we're talking about the mystery of Christmas. This is actually something I've been wanting to talk about for a while because... You know, I know that of all, of all the, uh, let's call them dual purpose holidays, right? The holidays that are both, you know, like sacred and, you know, and secular. They have like a, a religious element and they also have kind of a not so religious element. You know, Christmas definitely of all the religious holidays has the most pop culture stuff that goes with it, right? Right? I mean, there's, I mean, there's the Easter bunny and he's fine, but dude, he can't even, even hang with Santa, right? I mean, Santa's the man, right? It's like, it, what, what, this eggs, oh great, versus, you know, presents and clothes and socks and can't, I mean, it's just, you know, I, I, I know, and here's the deal, I know that, and even in the, the sacred part of Christmas, I know Christmas is about a baby. And so like Christmas is always better when there's little kids around and there's children. Right? I mean, it's like, it's great. But don't be fooled by that. Because Christmas, this holiday, leads us deep into the deepest mysteries of the universe. The deepest mysteries of faith are right there in Christmas. In fact, if you really are getting, and I think of all the years, of all the Christmas seasons where it's probably smart for us to go, to just go, all right, I'm getting my scuba gear on and we're going to take a deep dive. This is probably the best year to do this. And if you're doing it right and you're doing Christmas right, 
every, actually, frequently, you sh- you'll be saying, like people often said when they hung around Jesus, whoa, this is hard to understand. Like Nicodemus, he was a religious, a great religious scholar. And yet, in a conversation with Jesus, he had that quizzical look on his face when Jesus was explaining to him the realities that he came to unfold. And he said, ah. How can these things be? In that manger, which is made out of stone, by the way, not wood, because stone was cheap back then and mangers weren't, and you were feeding animals in mangers, so you're not going to make it out of wood. But in that manger, little side fact, in that manger, there are some deep, in fact, there are the deepest mysteries. And this year, man, to get over what we got to get over, we need something deep and something strong. And if that's what we need, we've come to the right place. See, um, this story and, and, and mystery is a lot about the story that you perceive yourself to be in. Some people, and and it's easy for us to think this, especially in a year like this, when it feels so much like things are going wrong and hard and you keep feeling like a victim, right? Like other years, I can't even remember a year in which I felt more helpless. Like I felt like more of the difficulty that I was going through that was totally out of my control. I I almost long for the time when I'm screwing up my own life, right? I mean, that's that's one thing. But but this year, it's like it keeps being stuff that just happens to us. And it happens to us en masse. And so it's easy to start telling yourself the story of random things, that life is just randomly hard. There's a philosopher, a dude from Notre Dame, actually. Well, now he's at Oxford. But a uh, great, great uh, Catholic philosopher who says, the story we believe we are in determines what we think about ourselves, consequently how we live. The story that you are imagining that you are in. See, and all of us have this narrative in our head that says, okay, my story is this story. But the story that you think you are in, that is maybe the most determinative thing in your life, which is why, by the way, of the stuff, I keep parading these stats about how essential church is and how critical it is that we connect with God, how it is it is just absolutely, and for us, uncompromisingly essential. There's another thing, Gallup came out with this thing this week, somebody sent this to me, that um, the American, uh, American mental health ratings have reached their deepest low in two decades. Now, here's the thing. That's really sad, but by now, nobody is shocked. None of you are going, no way, (laughs) because, I mean, it's just so obvious. Here, let me read a little bit for you. According to the Centers for Disease Control in August, uh, August, two in five Americans reported suffering from symptoms, two in five Americans reported sufferings Um, from symptoms of anxiety, depression, trauma, stress-related disorders stemming from specifically from the pandemic. One in four young adults aged 18 to 24 seriously contemplated suicide. Did, Did you just hear that? Within the last 30 days of the survey, 16% said the same thing, but between the ages of 25 and 44. In other words, the older people aren't much better. Now, here's here's the weird thing. Those with the greatest ratings of mental health, same poll recently released by Gallup, those with the greatest ratings of mental health and well-being, the single factor that said that you were doing better than average is regular weekly religious service attendance. You're welcome. All right, so... They're the only stuff, yeah. Oh, clap, clap if you want. They're the only group of every group they surveyed. They surveyed Republicans and Democrats and men and women and uh, 
you know, people above this in income and below this income, the only group, the only factor that seemed to indicate that you were doing better than the average, none of those made any difference. Everybody's was down except for people that regularly came to church. Because You know why that is? It's because the story that you are imagine, that you imagine, that you think that you're in is all important. And see, mystery says to you this. Mystery says the story, there is more to the story. There's something in all of us that needs more to the story. Because otherwise, we're just in Randomville. We're in Randomville where just bleep happens. Remember, there, there used to be a bumper sticker that was quite, you know, pervasive. Stuff happens. It didn't say stuff, but it's bleep happens, right? And a lot of people, like, that's the story of their life. But we know, like, deep in our heart, in our gut, we know there is something more. And that's something that's underneath the random suffering and the random hardships is this thing called mystery. There is a mystery to this. And Christmas brings us face to face with mystery, which is kind of why... Like at Christmas, we like, isn't it funny? It goes with the season. Christmas is right very close to the shortest day of the year. I think the solstice is the 21st. Is that right? Is that usually? It's not usually. It's the same every year. Um, (laughs) You know, usually. Every on Groundhog's Day, however. No, I mean, it's it's in the, and like, like Christmas, we like dark with bright sparkling lights. We like stars, starry skies, and, th- and things like that because Christmas is about mystery. And so what we're going to do is savor a couple of the mysterious parts of Christmas. And I think our souls need this right now. And so what I'm calling this, this little section, this sermon tonight, is uh, today, this weekend, is three off-brand Christmas stories to ponder. They're off-brand in that, I mean, you probably have know as well as I do the main Christmas stories. There's one in Matthew about the angel that appears to Joseph, right? And says, take her as your wife, you know, Emmanuel, name him Jesus, right? You know that one. Then there's the one about the Magi, which actually is a little bit after the actual birth of Jesus. But you know about that one. And of course, you know about the, tr- the trip to Bethlehem and the shepherds and the star in the sky and everybody coming to the manger. You guys know that one, right? I mean, that's, that's Christmas 101. But there's... You could call this Christmas 201 or 1001 or whatever, right? That's, and these are off-brand stories. They all come from the same source, however. They all come from a guy named Yohanan or John. And John, he, he's, here's why these are interesting. John is probably, when Jesus was, you know, here in the flesh, he was Jesus' best friend. At the Last Supper, and you know the, pic, the famous picture, Da Vinci picture of the Last Supper? Don't picture that because they weren't sitting at a banquet table like they were at the head table and there was a mic and somebody was doing a roast of Jesus or something. Don't picture that. Picture a table that was more like thigh high, knee high, and picture people reclining it. That it was very, you know, it was the Middle East, not the Middle Ages. And they're, they're there and there was, there was, there, the seating was kind of, about closeness to Jesus. There was however many people were there, you know, the 12, of course, and then, you know, a few other people. But there was one guy that was right next to Jesus. In every story where Jesus just gets a few of them and says, okay, I need you guys to go do this with me. John is always the main guy. Peter, James, and John, like the inner circle and the inner inner person of the inner circle was this guy named John. When Jesus said, hey, listen, one of you is going to betray me. Peter motioned to John saying, okay, you're the one that's right next to him. Find out. That's John. John was maybe one of the youngest of the 12 too. Probably a teenager when Jesus said, come, follow me. And he's also the disciple that lived, well, it's partly because he was young at the time, but that lived the longest. The only one, tradition says, that didn't die a violent 
martyr's death. John wrote five books of the New Testament. They're all cleverly named John in some way, shape, or form, except for the final one, the apocalypse, the revealing of Jesus, revelation. So I'd like to just, and they they span about 20 years of his life from when he wrote the Gospels to when he wrote the letters, which are called 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and then when he wrote Revelation. That's probably, Revelation was probably the last one written during the Roman Emperor Domitian's reign, and that was about 90-ish AD, right? The other ones are maybe 20, 30 years. And so I'm going to just read three different Christmassy stories that are off-brand, that are about Christmas, but they're weird. They don't tell the story, they talk about the mystery. And I want you to just... So I want you to soak in the mystery with me, okay? If you're at your house and you can, like, lower the lighting, that'd be kind of cool because look at our backdrop. is really sweet and it's kind of cool, mysterious. It's a starfish, I think, of some kind or something. So whatever that is, it's very dangerous. You touch one of those, you die, all right? It's as simple as that. Talk about mystery. And all of them have our title. I picked a different Christmas carol. Here's the first one. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. You, get, you have to guess which Christmas carol that comes from. So, ready? Here it is. Uncle Eddie's going to read you a little story here. John 1, 9. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was In the world. Now, I want you to just feel John stretching, extending himself, straining language to help you and help himself wrap his head around this mystery. John's an interesting cat in that when you first learn Greek, when you go to seminary or if you take it in undergrad and you for your Greek one by the end of that year when you're still a rookie in Greek they well, the first thing in the Bible you try to read after you've learned you know the alphabet and the grammar and the various things the first thing they give you is first John John's Greek is it's it's so ironic because it's the easiest Greek in the New Testament it's the deepest concepts however There's nothing hard about the Greek here. If you're literally at the end of your first year, you could be reading this in Greek. But dang, is it. Ready? So just go with me here. Go with John. John says, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him. This is about Jesus. This is about the baby in the manger. And the world did not know him. The world was made through him, but it didn't recognize him. He came to his own, the people of Israel, those that maybe had a better chance at recognizing him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, well, he gave them the authority to call themselves technon, little children of God, even to all those who trusted in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, of humans, nor of the will of man, but of God. All those that did know him, they had their physical birth, yes, but they also had a heaven birth. Now, ready? We're going one more level down. <laughs> Here it is. And the word, the lagos, the word became 
sarks, flesh, meat, carne. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Doxa. John's Greek is so simple because Greek's not his first language. Aramaic was, and he could, Aramaic and Hebrew were what he trafficked in. He was from a village, uh, not a village, actually a decent sized city called Capernaum. Glory as of the only begotten, the monogenes. Here John is now making up words. This word is nowhere in, in Greek until this moment right here. Until the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just want you to savor that. That's Christmas for John. That the one who created showed up. And when he showed up, he was full of grace and truth. I ran into this um, quote in this tweet by this pastor this week. He said this. I think this is funny. He says, every other religion is offering swimming lessons to drowned people. <laughs> That's right. It's like, hey, uh, let's teach you the Australian call. <laughs> crawl. You know, it's like, no, see, Jesus, God didn't send Jesus to give you more good advice. He didn't send Jesus as one of the great sages. He sent Jesus to save us. That's why when Jesus came, he was full of grace and truth because you and I, we don't need help. We need deliverance. We're way past help. We're way past a tip or two or five noble truths or, eight, excuse me, eight noble truths or five pillars. We're way past that. We need somebody to save us. And when Jesus came, he came in truth, but he came in grace as well. But notice this, verse 14, I want to show you something that's kind of cool. And it's this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwell there is this word eskenosen in Greek. Skeno, eskene, right, is a tent. What John is saying is this, is that there's this, of all the the mysterious things. Like God says when they, or John says, you remember when our forefathers, the children of Israel, remember when they were traveling through the desert and God had them build a tent? Do you guys, anybody know about this? They're in the wilderness and you're in the desert. You've got all these people, a whole nation of people in a barren desert. And God says, I want you to build a tent, which is a good idea if you're out in the wilderness and you're camping, tents are good. But God says, I want you to build a tent. We'll call it the tent of meeting. And here's the deal. I want you to make it out of fine and rare material. And I'm going to be really specific. And here's the place out in the outer courts of the tent because the tent's going to have like, like a walls, like canvas walls around it. And I want you to, you know, like have like, like an outer place where there'll be altars and different things like that. And then there's going to be a place called the holy place. And then there's going to be the Kedosh Kedoshim, the holy of holies. And then when they, when they got out of the wilderness, because you could see them going, oh, okay. And what's going to be in the tent? Like in that holy of holies, what do we put in there? And God says, you don't put anything in there. They're like, all right. So we're building a tent. We're not supposed to put anything in it. You just, you know, just the only thing I want in there, God says, is I want the ark in there. And they're like, what, the boat? And he goes, no, the other ark, the Indiana Jones ark. Put that one in there, right? The one the Nazis are going to try to get someday. Get that one. And they had no idea what they were doing it for. And then they built a temple. And even though the temple was massive, the actual temple itself was the exact same dimensions as this tent thing. And it had the holy place and the holy of holies. And again, they stuck the ark in there. And when they were finished with the tent and they put that ark of the covenant in to this thing. And then the same thing happened when they were finished with the temple and it took them like years to build that thing. And they put the ark of the covenant in. Then something came from heaven onto that spot called the Holy of Holies and onto the temple. They also had a Holy of Holies there and it was called the Shekinah, the Shekinah, the glory like you could see it 
Like it was this place, this moment. Now ready? The word for that tent, in English it's called the tabernacle. The word is the word that John uses right here. He came, he says, and the word became flesh and became the tabernacle right among us. So here's what's happening with this mystery. Jesus is the tent. He is the tabernacle. He is the temple. As mysterious as that is, the body of Jesus was the place where heaven and earth intersect. It was the new temple. God's concern for his world and even our bodies. God says, here's, here's what the temple is going to be. That's my son. He is the temple. Listen. The fact that Jesus, the creator of all things, somehow enfleshed in a body is forever proof that God cares about this world and your body and the bodies of the people that you love and you care about. Which is why, ready? This is going to be kind of weird. But why we feel the way that we feel about disease and sickness. See, we're not just scared, although we are that of disease, and we're not just sad, right? There's a feeling as we are, even tonight, as we are praying for that little one, even today, as we're praying for that little one, there's another feeling in you, isn't there? And it's this, I'm not just sad, and it's not just compassion, I'm offended at this. I'm offended that this could even be, that I live in a world where that could be. Is, are you not? A little, bit of, a little bit angry? It's because Jesus came to say, no, I, I'm here. I'm here in the real world with you. If you're thinking, whoa, this is, this is a lot to take in. Yes, I told you Christmas leads you into the deepest mystery. Here's the next one. It's not John, the Gospel of John. It's 1 John. It's one of the letters. John, now he's moved. He doesn't live in Israel, in Capernaum, where he's from. He doesn't live there, or Jerusalem. He now lives in modern-day Turkey. And he's a pastor in this massive city called Ephesus, overseeing dozens and dozens of churches in the area. And John, this is, here's this, you guys know what Christmas Carol, this is from Veiled in Flesh, the Godhead Sea, Hail Incarnate Deity. Anybody know that one? Here it is. Here's how he starts this letter. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And that life was manifested. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal, that the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. We have seen and heard and proclaimed to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. John is saying this. Are you feeling it? It's like we, here's this mystery. We were touching God. At Christmas, it's, I know it's almost too much to even contemplate, but somehow in the, that baby, they were changing God's diaper. Now he wants to touch us and connect with us and us with each other. Here's the third Christmas story. It's going to just keep getting weirder. 
right? They're all, notice they're all chapter one. They're all how John starts things out. So this is from the last book of the Bible, a book called Revelation. So if you didn't, if you wondered if it was going to get weird, well, everything in this book is kind of weird. But this is at John, the end of John's life. And he is now um, an exile. There's an island off the coast. He's from Ephesus. And Ephesus is a coastal town. I've been there once. It's amazing. It, like huge ruins. It was a massive city. And there's big mountains all around it. But then it goes right to the, to the coast of the Aegean Sea. And off the coast of that, there's this island, Patmos. And John was imprisoned and in exile there when he wrote Revelation. And he's having this vision. Now keep in mind... This is Jesus' best friend, all right? Now let me read this to you. John is seeing this vision, and he says, Then I turned, and I saw there's a voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven menorahs, seven big old, you know, like, you know what a menorah is? It's Hanukkah for crying out loud. You can picture a menorah, right? Okay, I saw seven of those things, and they're made out of gold. And in the middle of these lampstands, I saw one who was like the son of man clothed in a robe reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash he and his head and his hair were white like wool and like snow and his eyes were like a flame of fire and his feet was like glowing on fire bronze like molten bronze and when it had been made to glow in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters and in his right hand he held seven stars and and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword if you're thinking I'm kind of having a hard time picturing this well <laughs> duh John saw it and he's having a hard time writing it and his face imagine staring at this face his face was like the sun shining in its strength like at midday John says this, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head, right? Isn't that such a weird irony? That just one that we adore, this babe... This person, Jesus, that John was casual enough with at the Last Supper to be like having his head on his shoulder, just kind of listening to him talk. Now he sees this Jesus as like kind of like the, the curtain is pulled back. This is my best friend. And when I see him, I am undone by him. And I fall at his feet involuntarily like I'm dead, like I, I, I can't do this. And then Jesus placed his right hand on me, John says, and says, do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last and the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys to death and Hades. Make no mistake, the one we're dealing with at Christmas. This, this, by the way, is why Jesus had to pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. They don't know. This one. So here's the deal with John falling at his feet. This worship, this response of worship and deepening, that in times like this, in seasons like these, this is what strengthens our grip. And the reason I want us to just have these offbeat, off-brand Christmas stories is that I think in this moment, our grip on God needs to be strengthened. Anybody with me on that? And there's three ways, I'm going to leave, the, the, leave you with this, three ways that this strengthens our grip. Ready? Here they are. This helps us to trust and surrender and never let go. 
pondering and savoring the mysteries, even though it's hard, even though it strains your brain, even though it makes you go, I, I don't get this. I don't, I don't quite understand this. Yes, that's exactly right you don't get it. It's, it's a little past getting, but here's what that does. It helps us to trust and surrender and to never let go because God never lets go of us. Mystery prepares us like like trafficking and soaking in these mysteries. It prepares us for the other mystery. And you know what that is? That's the mystery of your life. Life, like let's face it, life is pretty darn mysterious, isn't it? Life and marriage and suffering and loss, mystery keeps us from losing God in the midst of the mystery of life. It enables you to savor and enjoy God more so that when you face life, you go, you know what? God is bigger than this. He's deeper than this. Here's number two. Worship and deepening strengthens our grip because we pray boldly, even into improbability and even into impossibilities. See, I think when you think that God is just a big, strong, smart, more moral version of yourself. Like God's like me. When I have like remade God into Ed's image, only like a better version of Ed, like an idealized version of an ultimatized version of Ed, then I, when, when I really need to trust God, I'm, I'm, I'm weak because that person I'm imagining, that's really not God. But when we enter into who God really is, see, that's what Christmas is designed to help us do, to realize this one is the one who created everything, and yet he was walking amongst us, and we beheld his glory like as of God himself. It enables us to pray boldly. See, here's something we sometimes get wrong. We think we've got to understand like why something's happening or what's going on or like why now or whatever before we can trust God. But the reality is, here's the biblical order, is we don't understand and then we trust and believe. We believe so that we can understand. As we trust God, the understanding comes. As we choose to pray and pray boldly and make declarations boldly and agree with what God's word says, then we can, we can understand. There's even a little Latin phrase for that that comes from St. Augustine, Augie, as I call him. Um, we believe so we can understand. And here's the third way, okay? And I saw this on Instagram. Do you guys have that picture thing? Yes, no, yes. Let me see that. You guys see this? Have you seen this on Instagram? I love that. I want to get my hands on one of those, don't you? That would be a cool, like, diagram. But this is, I like how they put this. This is the season, but that's the reason. You like that? I like it. See, here's what that tells us. In the Christmas season, with much joy, in the midst of that, we remember that Mary, the mother rejoicing over this child while she was in the temple with him, one of the things that was said to her, it says, and she, she stored up all these things in her heart. One of the things that was said to her is, this child, oh, a sword will pierce your own soul. And when Jesus was wearing the crown of thorns, most of the disciples had temporarily deserted him. But you guys know this, right? There were a couple of people standing there. John was one of them. But you know who else was standing there? Right? You know, Mom, Mary was standing there. And I can't help but think, that she remembered that time in the temple and she goes, oh, so this is what he was talking about. (laughs) 
Here's the deal. Here's what mystery teaches us. We worship no matter what. No matter what, we worship. Because we never forget the cross. The cross is the ultimate demonstration that God is for us, that he loves us, that he'll go to any lengths for us, that he has had victory on our behalf already, that we can speak to God with great confidence and in the name of Jesus. And we know that he is going to deliver us. But that doesn't mean, of course, right? The cross also says, okay, there's going to be some things I don't understand here. There's going to be some days when I'm waiting for my son to raise from the dead. If you're married, there's going to be some days where we're waiting for resurrection. We just know that God always wins. And so we worship no matter what. We worship when we have the victory, right? Yay, cool, easy to, easy to do then. But we also worship while we're waiting for the victory. And that... That's hard. But it's precious. Peter said, another friend of Jesus, he said that that's, that's the proof of your faith and it's more precious than gold. So this season, let's, Let's go a little deeper. I, I, let's, can you do that for Christmas? Maybe you can give yourself a little Christmas gift. And that's this. Give yourself the gift of savoring the mystery. Maybe even using these very passages and reading them over and over and over and going, God, I'm not sure I'm getting this. And God's going, yeah, I'm sure you're not getting it, actually. But it's good for you to try it's good for you to just, because when you go, I, I don't understand, God goes, yeah, that's kind of life, isn't it? So let's choose right now to worship God, whether we're sitting on some awesome victory or whether we're still waiting for resurrection. Are you, are you good? Let's do that. What do you guys say? Let's do it. So let's pray. And I'll leave you with one last word from our, our guide this tonight from John the Apostle. He said he was right here. We touched him. The word of life was right here. We, we had him with us. We ate with him. We sailed on the sea with him. He, and he says, after all that, after all that God encounter closeness, here's the bottom line. John says it right there in verse five. Here's what we learned about God. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. He's 100% light and he's 100% good. And so even when we don't see it yet, we give thanks and we worship So this week, here's your homework, your assignment. Worship. If I set aside some time in the day to worship, to seek God, to maybe read these passages, maybe get the Journey Christmas album or the Journey Worship album and let a song just play and just sit there and soak in it and think about it and ponder and let if you'll let him, God will take you a little deeper even this week. Now, 
If you made a decision to trust Christ, you can let us know right there. Just click right there and let us know. Type a little message. There's somebody right now, like literally right now, a real life human that um, would like to know that and help you to get started right. And also is ready to pray with you. So here in the room, we have people that'll pray with you. And more importantly, I mean, because there's more of you, right? It's not more important, but, but right now online, there's people ready to pray for you about whatever breakthrough you need to sit with you, to pray with you, and to go through this with you. So Lord, we trust you. You are light. You are good. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be the tent, to be the glory, to be a place and a person through which we can know you and know real life. Take us deeper. Deepen our joy this season because we need it, God. We need it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we'll be back next week. We have services online at 9 and 11 and then on demand. Um, We have services in the tent at 9 and 11. Those are on Sunday. And then Friday night, if you want to be a part of the recording, you're welcome to come too. All right, God bless you guys. And we'll see you next week. I'm